When I was a 20 year old college student, I walked into a library and the moment my cheeks hit the seat, it's like lightning went through my back. Half of it went up, half of it went down. And I'm sitting there like, oh, I gotta write a paper, but I can't even sit still. I couldn't sit because if I moved anyway, it hurt. So I tried to stand up and that didn't work any better. It just hurt. So I tried to walk over and here after it just, it hurt. I was literally laying there on the floor of the theological library at Azusa Pacific. I just thought to myself, hey, this too shall pass, right? Until it didn't. <laughs> Until 30 minutes after me laying there, I uh, yell uh, like an idiot, like, like Urkel from that movie. I've fallen and I can't get up. You remember that TV show? Those of you who are under 40, sorry, you don't know. But, uh, uh, oh, I feel old. Whew. I'm telling a story about back problems. Just lean into it, Kyle. Here we go. So I'm laying there and I was like, I've fallen. I can't get up. I have two strangers walk over to me and they're like, what is going on? Is this guy having a spiritual experience? What is it? And I said, can you help me up? And they're like, yeah. So they help me get up and I'm literally being carried off. Like, you know, like the 300 pound lineman when he like turns an ankle in a game. That's me, except I'm 20 and I was typing a paper, and they walk me to the library, or they walk me out to the door, like, you need help getting back? I like, no, I think I can get to my apartment by myself. So I walk back to my apartment, like one of the butterscotch boys being like, ah, you want some candy? But my back is doing one of these things. And I go to bed and I wake up and it's fine. For three months. Until three months later, I feel that again, the lightning, zzz, it goes through my body and I'm like, it happened again. And then it kept happening every three to six months. And now here I am 20 years later. And after getting back from a month of vacation, I jump into summer blast. And the morning of summer blast, I wake up. And for the first time, it's not the stiffness that I felt. It's not that. It's a whole new thing. There's this thing where there's this big pain right here. Stop looking at my butt. Now, in this moment, there's this big pain. And it just goes all the way down here. And I was like, I've never had this before and it never went away. And so I asked myself this question, is it always gonna be this way? I started with back pain at 20, and I started wondering, what, what happened? Is it something I did? Did I do something foolish to cause it? I don't know. Is it, is it, uh, is it something I didn't do? Did I not strengthen or stretch, or did I not do something? I don't know. What I like to do is blame it on someone else. Oh, the genes my mom and dad gave me. Like, not these, but like the... Because when you're 20, it's so much better to blame things on your parents than take it responsibility for yourself. Good, you're with me. Okay. <laughs> and in that moment, I asked that question, will always be this way. I just want to ask you, you been there? Okay, maybe not laying on the floor of the library, but maybe there's some sort of pain or sickness. You wonder, is it always going to be this way? Maybe it's not physical, maybe it is a mental health struggle, lies that go through your head over and over, and you know they're not true, but they don't seem to go away. Maybe there's some sort of hurt, habit, or hang-up that you've carried with you your entire life. Maybe it's some habits, I'll never do it again until you do. And you look inside yourself and wonder, is it always going to be this way? But for some of you, the pain and the problem isn't like me where it's inside of me. For some of you, the pain and the problem uh, is someone in your life. Don't look at the person next to you. <laughs> Keep eye contact. You think it's bad now, just wait for that car ride home. Maybe it's a person who's become a problem or maybe there's a person that you love and they're struggling with a problem and it seems like you just can't be happier as long as your kid, your spouse, your parents continue with that struggle, it just seems like it's never going to end. For some of you, it's not uh, inside of you, it's not personal. For some of you, you look at the world and say, this is the way the world's always going to be. Are we always going to be divided? Are we always going to be better at calling names than making solutions? Are we always going to be more about talking badly about the other person instead of seeing the humanity in them? Is this the way the world's always going to be? You been there? You see, and in that... In that question, God brought me to this passage that we're looking at today, and I realized I'm not the first one to ask the question. There's someone else that we're going to see in this passage who's doing the exact same thing. They've done everything they can over and over and over, exhausted all resources for 12 years, and they've wondered, is it always going to be this way? So if that's you, or maybe there's someone in your life who needs this word, and you can speak this word of encouragement, 
But if that's you wondering it, go ahead and grab your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter nine, and let's see what happens when someone asks this question, is it always gonna be this way? Matthew chapter nine, we're gonna begin right in the middle of the story, verse 20. Let me jump in, Matthew nine, verse 20. Will it always be this way? Just then, the woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up and touched the edge of Jesus' cloak and said to herself, if I can only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Well, what does this mean? What does this mean? A woman with the issue of bleeding for 12 years, essentially what this means, friends, is that for the last 12 years, she's been on one never-ending menstrual cycle. To which some of you are like, that sucks. But back then, it's even worse. Because in that day and age, if you are bleeding, you are considered unclean. You're then put into quarantine, right? So she's been in essentially a 12-year quarantine, which means uh, when she has something good happen to her, she can't go and high-five her friend. When she's struggling, she can't have someone who hugs her and do that. When she needs a word of hope or encouragement, she doesn't get to go to church or synagogue and being connected with the people of God. She's completely isolated. She's tried every medical thing possible. And in that, if that's not bad enough that she's totally disconnected, in this day and age, a woman's primary value is what? Birthing children. And so maybe she's in a situation where she was married and she can't live up to her expectations, and so her husband has complete and total freedom to walk away and find someone who can fulfill their obligations in the marriage. So here she is, alone, desperate, but she comes up to Jesus and says, if I can just touch his cloak. Is this desperation? Is this faith? And why is it cloak, by the way? Why not just say, if I can touch any part of his clothing, Is the cloak somehow special? Why not like, if I could just touch any part of his body, just jump and touch the ankle, ooh, that's enough. Maybe like Jesus, uh, the way I've seen him portrayed, kind of like Fabio with the long locks going down, if I could just touch any part of those long flowing locks, maybe, just maybe, I'd be healed. Why touch his cloak? It's interesting. Go on a little detour with me, let me explain it. See. If you flip over to Malachi or just follow along on the screen, in Malachi chapter four, uh, there's this prophecy of one who will become Messiah. And there's uh, there's this belief that gets built on top of this verse, but it's gonna take a minute to explain it. Let me go with this. Malachi chapter four, verse two. In the NIV, it says it this way. But for those who revere my name, the son of righteousness, that's S-U-N, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays and you will go forth and frolic like a well-fed cow. So I'm like, I don't get any of that, but I like the well-fed cow part. It's interesting, this word raise is difficult to translate, and I'm gonna illustrate it by looking at another translation. This is the ESV, English Standard Version. Again, same verse, but for those of you who fear my name, so far, so good, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing, and it's not rays, but wings, and you shall go forth like leaping calves from the stall. Wait, 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 wait. Is it rays, is it wings, what is it? It's interesting, this verse, this is written about 400 years before the time of Jesus, and it's this idea about a coming Messiah who will come and save, and the legend of it grows, the teaching of it grows as the rabbis continue to do it, and it then becomes this idea that whoever grabs his zitzit will be healed. So I'm like, well, what's a zitzit? I have no idea either until I started studying and looked it up. Essentially, the seat seat is this. It's the tassels of a rabbi's garment. Check it out, we got a picture here. The idea was, if you could just touch the Messiah's seat seat, you could experience healing. Go into this next verse, or this next one, and you can see it here. What is it that this woman has? Is it desperation? Maybe. But what does she really have? She has the belief that what God said in his word was true and that the Messiah was coming to save her and he and only he alone could do it. She illustrated this. I wrote in my notes this way. She embodies this. What is faith? Faith is action rooted in hope. 
Faith is not a cognitive thing I believe. I check all these boxes. Faith is not a, hey, maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. Faith is action that she took. She reached out feeling like, if I just touch his seat seat, I will be healed, even though nothing else has worked. Because she had hope in God and his character. What might that look like for you today? Last Sunday, um, we celebrated Summer Blast and an amazing kids program. Our Encore Ministry hosted an amazing barbecue afterwards. And I'm there just meeting people and someone comes up to me who I'd never met before. And I said, hey bro, how long have you been coming to the church? He's like, two weeks. I'm like, all right, you're a veteran. Welcome to the club. I said, hey, uh, well, what brought you here? The tenor of the conversation changed. It was easier when we're talking about work and friends and all those, and in this moment he has this pause. And he says, you wanna know? I said, I asked. He said, I've been struggling with substance abuse for over five years now. No one knows it. On the surface, I keep getting promoted in my job. My wife and my kids, they look like everything is great, but I know that I've been using this thing because I can't cope any other way, and two weeks ago I realized that I've gotta do something different. So what'd you do? He said, I stopped. He breaks eye contact, looks away. He starts getting teary-eyed and looked at Bay and he's like, I just knew I had to turn to Jesus. I said, but why? You can turn to a million things. You can turn to uh, willpower, you can do it yourself. You can turn to some sort of other sort of recovery program that may or may not have any faith component in it. You could turn to anything, but why did you turn to Jesus? He said, honestly, people wouldn't know it by the way I've lived, but I grew up going to church. My parents took me, I learned the Bible, I did all those things, and I knew the truth, but I just chose not to do it. I chose to do it my way instead of his way. But at the end, somehow those truths of God got planted so deep in my heart that in this moment where I realized I couldn't save myself, I knew he was the best option for me. He experienced what this woman had. Long time problem, will it ever change? This belief that the word of God is true, that God's character longs to forgive and to heal and transform, and in the end, he is the best option for me. See, he had faith, what was that? He took an action, I'm going to stop this, I'm going to turn to Jesus, why? Because I have hope in God. But what does hope and what does healthy hope look like? We're starting to see that faith is the combination of action and hope coming together. Because faith with only action is a formula because you think you can control God. Faith uh, with only hope is a, hey, sit there passively. But faith with these two things together, what does a healthy hope look like? Let me explain it this way. The best way I can articulate hope is from a study that was done of people who survived concentration camps. See, they found that the people who survived concentration camps had two things in common. Number one, they had a belief that they would get out eventually. And number two, they had a belief that it would be a long time from now. And what they found is those who only had one, those who say, it's always gonna be this way, they died quickly because they lost their will to live. And those who believed that they were gonna get out quickly, they died as well, why? Because they didn't have the stamina for the long haul of the struggle, right? 12 years in, it's not happening, I'm done, I'm accepted it. 20 years into back pain, I'm done, this is how it's always gonna be. However long your forever has felt, it's that moment where you realize that God isn't done with me yet, that God has been faithful his entire life, and even though I've done everything in my power and it hasn't happened yet, I have faith, which means I have actions that point me towards Jesus and hope that he can still do it. This is what we see here in this woman. If I can just touch his seat seat. So what happens? This woman, who should be in quarantine, pushes through the crowd, goes and touches him. And in verse 22, look at how Jesus responds of Matthew chapter nine. When Jesus saw her, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. And the moment, m woman was healed at that moment. Could you imagine what it's like with the feeling of being, wait, I'm healed, but am I really? Could you imagine what it's like as she's wrestling with this idea like, oh my gosh, I can go back to a normal life again? 
But let me ask you this, it's probably not all great, why? Because Jesus is in the middle of a huge crowd. There's people crowding him every time. And when he goes and puts the spotlight on her, everybody knows in the town that this girl who's supposed to be on quarantine uh, came to the concert even though she was contagious. Sent her, her kid to school even though the kid was contagious. And in this moment, could you imagine what it's like being her when she knows I'm not even supposed to be here and everyone here who I've touched to get here is unclean. Why can't Jesus just do a shh, hush, hush, quiet side miracle, let nobody else know? Why does he draw attention to her? And even worse, why does he embarrass her? And why in the very next story will he do the exact opposite? And instead of putting that next person as a public spectacle, why does he put this one as a public spectacle? That, my friends, is the big question this text is trying to get us at. There's this question that makes no sense, and that's where the readers like, or the authors like, lean in, there's something here. So why does he put her on blast? Why does he put her front and center so everyone can see? Let's put that on a hook. We'll get back to it, because that's the important piece here. And that's what we're gonna get to in a second. So stick with me. So here we have this woman. So it's always gonna be this way and now it's not. Somehow she had faith, she had hope, she took an action, she went for it. But she's also interrupting something. See, I started at verse 20, but let me go back to 18 and show you where this story began. Just go up just before this, just before this woman, verse 18. While Jesus was saying this, i.e. teaching in front of a large crowd, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him. My daughter has just died, but come and put your hands on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him and so did his disciples. Imagine this dad. I've been told the greatest pain you can ever experience is the loss of a child. And in this moment, he's lost his precious baby girl. And so with faith, i.e., he took action to come to Jesus and hope that he could do it. And in this, he, Jesus says, okay, I'll go with you. And all of a sudden, he's gotta be so excited. Why? Because Jesus said he's gonna do my thing. He's gonna heal the miracle. My baby girl might live again. And in that moment, he's so excited until he's walking and all of a sudden, Jesus stops. Like, hey, Jesus, we're actually going this way. The house is this way. And then all of a sudden, like, uh, Jesus, why are you back here? And Jesus had an ADD moment. He gets distracted by this woman. And now, this religious leader, we find out from another writing, his name's Jairus, and Jairus, the synagogue leader, is waiting for Jesus, who's now interacting with this unclean woman. And she gets healed. And her, his daughter, is dead. Could you imagine what it's like when you're at the greatest pain in your life and it seems like someone else gets the miracle and you don't? Oh, it's even worse. He's a synagogue leader. What does that mean? He's well respected for his knowledge of scripture, for his involvement, attending, serving, leading religious rituals. And in this moment, he's like, I've done everything right. I've become a religious leader. And here this woman who's unclean breaks the rules and she gets it. He's like, why have I spent my whole life following the rules just to be where I am today? You been there? Jesus, why? And we'll see why. The story continues, jump down to verse 23. When Jesus entered the synagogue houses, or the synagogue's leader house, he saw the noisy crowds and people playing pipes. That's playing pipes, not smoking them. I know it's in California, it's a little tricky here. Why are they playing pipes? Like, why is there a marching band there? In this day and age, grieving was a part of their culture. After someone died, you would actually hire professional mourners to come. They would wear the clothes, they would sing the songs, they'd play the music, and for a minimum a week after someone died, you'd have this grief ritual. Now, for some of you, like, that's super crazy. Why would they do that? Um, well, two things. Number one is we're just not very good at grieving. We'd rather move on to the next thing than stop and deal with our grief. But that's another sermon. But also, we do this, we just do it differently. We have a chaplain come before the person dies and they pray the prayers and they go through it and we start our grieving before the person dies. So in this, imagine they've hired professional mourners and grievers to come. Everyone who comes to the house knows that they're grieving. Everyone in the city, in the town, knows that this little girl's dead. And Jesus said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, 
he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. Let me read this in Mark's version because Mark adds some other details here that I think are important for us to see as we bring these two stories together. So again, Mark is another one of four gospels, four stories. He adds some details I want to include here. So Mark 5, 37, Jesus allowed no one but Peter, James, and John to come in. They came to the house where the leader of the place of worship lived. Jesus found many people making noise and crying. He went in and asked them, why is there so much crying? The girl is not dead, she's asleep. But he sent them all out of the room. Then he took the girl's father and mother who were with him. They went in the room where the little girl was. He took the little girl by the hand and said, little girl, I say to you, get up. At that very moment, the girl got up. She was 12 years old. They were very much surprised and wondered about it. And get this, this is an important contrast that the authors put there for a reason. You've got to get this. He spoke sharp words to them that they could tell nobody and give her something to eat. <laughs> I guess after you're dead for a little bit, you are hungry. Two things going on here. Number one, why with this first person is the healing public and why in the second is it private? And secondly, what is this idea of this girl being dead or not dead have to do with anything? All right, I know I've been rambling for a little bit, so, so let, me, let me tell you, one of the things that's struggled with this story is everyone in the story knows she's dead. The dad says she's dead. The mourners say she's dead. Everyone knows she's dead. And Jesus says, no, she's just asleep. Which makes me ask this question, is Jesus lying? Um, is uh, Jesus uh, have some sort of like metaphorical idea of sleep? Have they misdiagnosed her? And I still kept asking this question, is Jesus lying? And it took me back all the way to Exodus chapter one, where we have the first time of someone lying for a good reason. It's when the, the, the uh, Israelites are enslaved and Pharaoh says, kill all the firstborns. And the midwives uh, go and they deliver the babies and they don't kill the baby boys. And they just lie and say, sorry, the Israelite women are so strong. Uh, they get give birth before we can get there and execute their firstborn. And there's this idea that maybe there's something good. And so I'm thinking through the morality questions as I'm wrestling with it. Pastor Will, our worship pastor, came and looked at me and said, Kyle, you're asking the wrong question. I'm like, what? He says, you're asking the wrong question. When you ask the wrong question, you're gonna get the wrong answer. And I said, shut up and go play guitar. <laughs> he says, no, no, you're asking a more reality question, and Jesus is answering a mortality question. What you talking about, Will? <laughs> See, what I realized is Jesus here is pointing to this truth here that for me, it's right or wrong, and he's like, no, 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 it's not about that. It's about this idea that nothing is so permanent that God can't change it. Do you get that? What Jesus is saying is, I have not come to make bad people good. I've come to make dead people alive. And in this moment, this woman thinks 12 years, it's permanent. And you may be here thinking, oh my gosh, death is permanent. Death is the final word. And what Jesus is saying is there is nothing so permanent that he can't fix it. Not even death. I have defeated death here with this little girl. And a few years later, I will defeat death again with my life, death, and resurrection. And in that moment, there is nothing so permanent that my power and my grace cannot transform. Nothing is too permanent for the power of Jesus. And what it does is it reframes everything. See, for me, I look, oh my gosh, half my life, 20 years, I've had this back problem, but what it changes for me is, oh my gosh, this life that I live, 80 years plus or minus, is just a, just a snap, just a blink, just a vapor going through it in terms of the eternity that I'll live with Jesus. And don't get me wrong, I'm hoping and I'm praying that in this lifetime, my back issues are healed and gone. Yes, I am, but I also know that even if the rest of my life I have this issue, I just know that will be a moment compared to eternity because nothing is so permanent that he can't fix it. So, if there's nothing so permanent that he can't fix it, why does he do it differently? 
We get to the main point. We get to the crux of it here. We get to this thing. Why? With this woman with the issue of blood, it's public. And with this little girl, don't tell anyone. Let's begin with the little girl. Could you imagine what it's like to be a 12-year-old girl and go to school the next day and was like, hey, look, everybody, it's zombie girl. She was dead, now she's alive. Could you imagine what people would write in her yearbook? Yearbook? Could you imagine the type of uh, scrutiny and bullying there? And that's just as you're 12 years old. Imagine when she goes to get a date for prom. Hey, who wants to take the dead girl to prom? You'll have the time of your life. Wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. And it sounds crazy now, but it's even worse then. Why? Because at 12, this is foreign to us, but 2,000 years ago, that's prime marrying age. They're trying to set her up for a future to get her the very right partner so that she can live happily ever after. And who's gonna come and say, oh yeah, yeah, I wanna live happily ever after with the dead girl. Is it possible that maybe, just maybe, Jesus looks at this girl and says, if this becomes public, it will ruin her life. And for that reason, I'm gonna say, no, this needs to be kept secret. But for a woman who publicly has been known for 12 years to be unclean, what she needs is the affirmation of her rabbi, her messiah, her religious teacher to say, she is not only clean, but she can touch me and nothing happens. She can touch you and nothing happens. And she needs, the whole community needs to know that she can be reinstated into the community again because she is no longer a health threat to you. She is a sign that nothing is so permanent that God can't do it. Jesus knows that for one person, they need the miracle done in private where no one sees it, and the other one needs to be as public as possible so that everyone can see it. And friends, this is the genius of Jesus. So if you're writing notes, you're taking it all down, here's where it all comes down to. Jesus loves folks one at a time, but it's never on your timing. Let me say it again. Jesus loves you one at a time, but it's never on your timing. Single folks, I get the struggle of, when am I finally gonna get dated? When am I gonna get married or remarried or whatever it may be? And there's that moment and then you start to get insecure like, oh, I'm always gonna be this way. Is there something wrong with me? Is there metaphorical broccoli on my teeth and something's there? And that other person, they crazy. And there I even found someone. And if that person's that jacked up and they found someone, how jacked up must I be? Just to be clear, uh, those are the married people who are laughing because the single people are like, yo, that's too close and too real. <laughs> some of you seri- single people, married people, need to be in some small groups together. At least you go out to lunch afterwards because just start, just stay on track. <laughs> and in this moment, you wonder, and you realize, oh my gosh, God's timing is different. And maybe for me, there's a different reason. And maybe my faith is trusting God and reaching out to God and say, God, why? What are you doing? I still hope that you will answer my prayer, I still know that you're at work, but God, help me understand why. Some of you have seen other people who are not as qualified as you, who are not as good at you, get promoted ahead of you, and you're like, why? What is going on? Is there something wrong with me? Or is there something wrong with God? Is there something wrong with this? And in this moment, you've gotta know that you may not, let me say it this way, Jesus may not have your timing, but he loves you one at a time because he knows exactly what you need. One needed private, one needed a public. You see, friends, this is why I trust Jesus. Because when I want something, he knows what I need. I want him to do something, and it seems like forever, but for him, it's just a moment. So in this, in this story, where do you find yourself? As the worship team comes out, I just wanna ask this question, where do you find yourself? We've been all over the place. Maybe you're here and you have lost hope that God will ever do or change anything. And in this moment, you need him supernaturally to speak hope in your life so you can believe it will get better. It may not be soon, but it will get better. You need hope. For some of you, you're like, no, I've got the hope. But Jesus, I don't know what that action is. I don't know if I go and reach out to Jesus. I don't know if I go and reach out to that person. I don't know if I go and stop trying to push that wall down and just stop and say, okay, I'm not gonna push that wall down for six months because for some reason I believe God's working and it's not my timing, but I'm just gonna have the action that says I'm just gonna pause. For some of you, it's not hope, it's not faith. For some of you, you realized 
that your timing is off and you've been so focused on this this blink of an eye that is the life we live that you've forgotten about the eternity of being with Jesus. And not only is the joy so much greater than the pain, but the purpose for what he has for eternity for you and for those around you is so much greater. And you've been asking morality questions, what is right and wrong? And Jesus is saying, don't you realize that you and others, that we all live forever? And you need to have an eternal perspective. Maybe you're here And you need to say, God, I'm so frustrated with you, but I'm gonna trust your timing, even if it's not mine. You see, friends, the thing I love about Jesus is he loves folks one at a time, even if it's not on our timing. And friends, let me just be honest, this is the type of church I want us to be. See, friends, I want us to be a church that experiences the love of Jesus so we can offer it to others. That you realize, oh my gosh, even in my imperfection and my brokenness, he saw it and saw past it and saw hope and a promise and realized that this is not my forever. And when Jesus saw past that, you can now do the same for others who all you can see in them is what's wrong with them. And they're always gonna be that way, but maybe just maybe you can see them with the eyes of Jesus that says, I love you and I see past your imperfections because it's not all of who you are. What I want you to be able to do is look at people who are in messy situations and say, I may not have all the answers. I don't know if you should do A or if I should do B, but I know the most important thing for you is that you turn to Jesus in this moment and know you're not alone. Because sometimes, friends, what Jesus shows with this woman cut in the act of adultery, she didn't just need a healing, she needed someone to know that she was with her. He needed someone to look at her in the eye and says, I see you, daughter, I love you. And friends, when you've got friends around here who are suffering, they don't only need your answers, though that's helpful, they need someone who says, I see you, I see your pain, and I'm with you in it. You see, friends, I want us to be a church that has an eternal perspective that says, 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 I do know that God wants to bring help and healing in this moment, but I will not be so focused on this momentary short-term pain that I forget the eternal thing that God is doing. Because God loves every single one so much that what did he do? He gave his one and only son. Why? So that you could live with him now and love him for eternity. This is the type of church I wanna be whether it be a kid walking through those doors and gets down and gets a high five there, whether it be a first time person who walks through those doors wondering, how is someone gonna treat me? Like, no, I want them to be treated the way Jesus would treat them. What I wanna be is a church that says, I know that there's pain and struggle, and if it's like that, I will be there with you, but I'm also gonna believe with hope and with faith that it's gonna get better. This is the type of church I wanna be who loves folks one at a time, and it may not be in my timing, but I know the only way to do it is to let him love and lead me so I can love and lead others one at a time just like he did. This is the genius of Jesus. I hope you learn it, live it, and live it out to others. Let's pray. Jesus, I apologize for the way that I've been so self-centered and so short-focused. So God, give me a bigger perspective. God, I pray for folks who are struggling and I pray that you'd give them hope. I see folks who need wisdom on what action to take and pray that you would give it to them or bring someone in their life to speak clarity and guidance to them. I pray for folks whose minds are bending, trying to reframe from a short-term perspective of just this life to an eternal perspective of the life to come. And I pray that you would lead them through those mental, spiritual, and heart gymnastics to bend and reorient their life. And Lord, lastly, while we all have different struggles, I pray that you'd give us the same eyes, the same heart, the same mind that sees and loves folks the way you do. Lord God, thanks for loving us one at a time. And I pray that by your love and by your power, you'd empower us to do the same. In Jesus' name.